So what does a biomedical engineer do? Day in, day out, is that the kind of job you would enjoy doing for your career? Well, we're gonna take a look at the day in the life of a biomedical engineer here in America and see if this is the dream job that you would be excited about. Hey friends, welcome to Chine Coaching. Rob here. We're really excited to share Bavia and her story, her journey, and what it's like to work here in America. We're going to learn so much. Bavia, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. This is Bavia, and I work as an R&D engineer um, in a company called Beckton Dickinson, also known as BD. And I completed my master's of engineering for biomedical through Cornell University. I am an international student and currently on OPD visa. Fantastic. And be sure to check out the other video we've made with Bavia, where she shares about her journey doing her master's degree in biomedical engineering at the Ivy League Cornell. That was a really fun conversation. And at Chine Coach, you want to help international students and professionals be successful in your cross-cultural journeys. We have videos like this to be a resource to you guys. I love having these conversations, sharing these stories. Be sure to connect with our community, with our newsletter, our Discord server. We're also going to have the timestamps in the video that you can check out the topics we're covering today. So first of all, Bavia, what does an R&D engineer do in medical devices? That's a great question, Rob. Um, I think an R&D engineer um, does a lot of things in their day, depending on whether they're working in sustaining engineering or new product development. And I'll give you a quick in, you know, overview of both of those. So if you're working in sustaining engineering, um, you're typically working on complaints from the field, or if there are changes in the material in the component from the supplier. Those are the two top categories, or there's a kappa, right? So corrective and preventive action. So if you're working on any of those, um, you would be focusing on, you know, if there are any changes being made to your design inputs, which is your products requirement, um, you know, user needs. Um, and then you kind of take that to your design output and you match that, that is the input meeting the output. And you do that by doing design verification. And sometimes you can get away by not doing design verifications and just performing a quick study, depending on how severe the change is. And all of this is driven by your regulatory affairs team, because you want to make sure that you're complying to all the countries that you're selling it in, and eventually you transfer it to the plant. So that is what you do on a sustaining project. Now, to add to this, what you do on a new product development is there is a vision, there is an idea of, you know, trying to bridge a gap in the field, which is your hospitals, your doctors, your nurses, anybody that's your customer, they can have gaps, right? They can want something better than what exists today, or they might want something that doesn't exist. And so you go ask them those needs, then you transfer their needs into your requirements for your product. And then you kind of repeat what we did in sustaining, which is, you know, understanding what's your output and verifying that design, validating the design, and finally transferring it to the market. And then you also do something called as a post-market surveillance, which is you want to kind of keep an eye on those products and make sure, hey, is it doing what we did in the lab? Is it the same? Is there a difference? Is there room for improvement? And if there is, then it goes into a sustaining project. So that's typical schedule of R&D engineer. R&D engineers also work with all the cross functions. So if you will enjoy teamwork, this is the kind of job for you because you will be interacting with your project manager or your program manager. You will be also working with other R&D engineers who can sometimes assist you or they may be leading the project. And then you work with medical affairs, regulatory affairs, quality, operations, manufacturing, and a bunch of other people. That's great. That's great. And one question you get a lot is, yeah. why are you working at BD, your company, Benton Dickinson? To answer that question, um, when I was applying for jobs right after my graduation, I did have um, offer from another top biomedical company. Um, I chose BD because they are more focused on your individual development as much as the company's growth, right? Mm. They don't want you to just give your best and let the company grow. They want you to grow as well. So they have certain programs in place which expects you to have um, goals every year and they are independent goals. Where do you see yourself in five years? And how, do you, how can we help you meet those goals? So that program allows you to take classes. So you can take some university classes. They have people coming from university in-house. Um, you have options to Coursera, Udemy, um, Howard Business Review, a lot of other resources 
that is just trying to, you know, help you grow. And I think I love that because when you're an entry level engineer, you want everything that you can get to make yourself independent, grow, and get that experience that you want, and you know, get fulfill your dream. So I think that's one of the reasons why I'm at PD. Yeah, it sounds like a great company culture where they really want to invest in you and not just take from you, and that, that's yeah. a, a great place to work. What are some of the important skill sets that are needed for this kind of job role? And again, I think here we are going to break a myth one more time. Um, I'm not going to name any softwares. I'm not going to say any technical skills. Yes, you do need them, but they can be learned. What you need、uh, for this type of job is critical thinking. You need to understand, right? So you need to understand what's changing, and that comes with your critical thinking.、Um, the other things you need is not fearing to fail, because as an engineer, you're going to fail a lot of times, and that failure is good too, because you learn、mm-hmm. a lot from that failure.、Um, and you know the ability to communicate. I think we don't emphasize a lot on soft skills, but that's what you need as an R and D engineer, because Everything that you do in your work in a day job, you need to tell that to all the other functions that we just spoke about, in a way that they understand, and they all have different levels of understanding. So now that is challenging. So you need to kind of sometimes make it easy, make it simple to help them understand what is going on. And I think those are the top skills that you need to get a job as an R and D engineer. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, so much more in America, especially is the soft skills. You can learn those technical skills. You're going to learn them in college, but、yeah. those soft skills is what's going to help you thrive, contribute, and stand out. So I'm so glad you shared that. If you guys are learning a lot and loving this video, give a big like and thumbs up to say thanks to Bavia. And Bavia, let's talk now about product life cycle. I know that's an important term in this industry. For people like me who don't know what that means, please tell us what product life cycle is. Absolutely. So I think we spoke about the steps in you know when we were talking about you know what does an R and D engineer do, and that's essentially your product life cycle. What does it mean when you you know you want to take an idea into the real life world? Right. It's not that easy. It's not that straightforward. Where you design your prototype and everything's going to happen. So there are a lot of steps that go in between. So we start with. Like I said, the voice of customer, hearing what they want. Are we going to do everything that they say? Probably not. You cannot fit everything in one product.、Mm-hmm. So you're going to make trade-offs, and that's where again critical thinking comes in place. Divide them, bucket them. What is absolutely necessity? What is a nice to have? What is going to stand as apart,、um, as opposed to our co- competitors? If there is anything in the market, right? Do you want to know that? Ask yourself those questions early on, because you cannot change everything. As we move further, there is no going back, and then you understand how do you design this, where you leave room for error from your manufacturing, you leave that for your supplier, you leave that for your engineer who's going to be testing, you leave that for every single person that's involved in the process, right? So now we are complicating. It's not as easy as oh, I'm going to draw something and everybody can meet that. You need to add tolerances, right? You need to add some room for error. And that's what's going to help you get to the next step. Then you come to design verification. That's where your math is the most important topic, because you need statistics, the right sample size. You need to know the right acceptance criteria. How do you define all of this? That's by having a risk document. Which part of this component can fail in the field? How severe of a damage is it going to be to the customer? How frequently is that going to happen? That's what goes in your risk document, and you take that, put a number to that. And that's the reliability that you want to meet on a product, right? And then you validate and say, hey, okay, everything's looking good so far. Is our plant going to be able to manufacture this? And for how long? Because these machines are not cheap. They are millions and millions of dollars. And you want to. These are high volume products, right? You sell millions of them in a month, in a week, sometimes. So you want to make sure: is this reproducible? Is this reliable? And then after all of that, you want to make sure can you sterilize this, right? You want to do all of these things,、um, and you want to make sure that it is safe for the patient. At the end of the day, the patient comes first, the safety comes first, and the quality of your product is what's going to define that safety, right? So that's what a product life cycle is, and that's why it's so important. Because if it's like dominoes, if one of these fails, everything is going、mm. to fail at the same time, and it's 
extremely important that you don't hurt another individual in that process. So friends, there you have it. That is product life cycle. And our chai question for this video is, would you want to be an R&D engineer? Just like Bavia is at BD, would you guys want to be an R&D engineer? Go ahead and throw your answer in the comments, you know, why or what makes you interested in that? Any specific kind of project or, you know, product that you would want to be an R&D engineer? Let us know in the comments. Let's talk a little bit more about this industry. Bavia, help us understanding a regulatory industry. What does that mean and why is that important? As we spoke about patient safety, right? Here you're not dealing with non-living things. You're dealing with real life people. Somebody, mm -hmm. sometimes it can be your family. It can be your friend. You know, it's somebody who you know. It's a real person. FDA and a lot of other standards across the planet, right? They try to put some regulations in place. They design some type of test that you have to meet if your device falls into that category. And if you don't meet that standard, you cannot sell that product in the market, right? So that's why there is not a lot of room to do what you want to do. Like mm -hmm. you can do with, let's say, you know, innovating some other product, which is not as regulated. So here you work and, you know, a lot of people are observing you and they want to know what you've done is valid and is safe for the person. So that's why it's important to understand a regulated industry because everything has to be precise. That has to be the same every time to be producible, reliable. There has to be a good confidence level to that product that you're making. And also you want to abide by those rules. There is no room to make an error. There is no room to negotiate. It has to be by the book. And that's why you will see a lot of aeronautical engineers or I would say aerospace engineers come into med devices because mm. it's kind of a similar environment. And yet they feel that they have every skill that they need to work in med devices. So I think if for you, um, community, helping the community is something that interests you. Um, you can be any type of engineer, mechanical, chemical, electrical. There is room in med device industry for you to be a part of. No, that makes sense, those transferable skills. And in America, there's so many regulations. It's an important thing because they want good quality, they want safety, but especially in healthcare and in medical industries, like the regulations are even a whole nother level there. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's people, you know, who are the end user and you want that safety and, and benefits. So it's really important, but it's a part of the job uh, to prioritize those things. And so, Bobby, what have you learned about how to find opportunities to grow within your company, to upscale yourself and to kind of build upon yourself while you're doing your full time job? That is a great question. And I've always wanted to answer that question. Um, I think you don't find those opportunities by just doing your job. You find them by keeping an open eye, by being aware, right? Every company has gaps, right? And you want to, there's nothing perfect in this world, right? So you're going to find those gaps. That's where your opportunity lies. You want to do what other people are not able to see. You want to find those opportunities and pitch your idea to your leadership and say, hey, I find these things, I can optimize them. Can I do that? That's how I found opportunities in my company. There was no defined project. There was no defined role. Nobody was assigned to do that job. I found that job because I found gaps and I wanted to bridge them. So I think if you want to grow, there is nothing in the book to tell you how to do that, right? There is no master's degree for being a leader. There is nothing, you know, well-defined on how to be a leader. I think you be a leader by experience. And you want to gain that experience as much as you can. So I think for me, it is interacting with people. Again, networking in a company. And mm -hmm. I don't actively do that or I don't consciously do that. But let's say, you know, I always join meetings on time. And, you know, that gives me sometimes five minutes while others are joining to have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And I'll ask them, hey, what what is something interesting you're doing? Tell me about it. And if I like that, I'll say, hey, can I um, do something that is, you know, over on your plate or if you're overburdened can i help you take some of that load off and i find that opportunity right nobody has to tell you that you can ask people around and get that thing that you like to do yeah everyone's looking for an employee who's not a problem finder but is a problem solver as when i was a, a boss when i was a leader it was never fun when someone comes to you with your problems 
it's the best thing when people come with ideas and solutions who want to help and want to make things better. And that's a great way to stand out and grow in your job role. That's just a side, your just basic job. And then, like you said, building those relationships and even looking for mentoring, finding other people who have different types of experience or who are ahead of you in the company. And you can get time with formally or informally and learn from them. Yeah. Those situations are really going to benefit you and help you just yeah. grow and grow and thrive. And who knows what it's going to lead to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one last thought um, I want to leave the audience with, I would say, is always speak up. Don't feel that you are an entry-level engineer or an engineer one, you know, if you're starting out, that you can't have valid thoughts or you don't have enough experience to have those thoughts. Sometimes those thoughts are exactly what a leader is looking for. Something innovative, something out of the box, something new. So don't fear being new to the industry to ask those questions or propose your ideas. I think go ahead and do that. That will also help you find those opportunities. And sometimes it will surprise you how people who've been in industry for so long might find that very attractive and very new and refreshing. So keep chasing those thoughts in your head and speak those out when you find the right opportunity to do so. Amazing. Bobby, thanks so much for sharing about your life and story being an R&D biomedical engineer here in America. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rob, for having me. I appreciate this. Yeah, this has been fun. Friends, be sure to like this video to say thanks and check out the other video we made with Bavia about her journey doing her master's degree there at Cornell University. And again, at Chine Coaching, we love helping you guys be successful in your journeys. Be sure to join the community, connect with us online on social media, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord server. We want to help you guys out. And this is so much fun. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time at Chine Coaching. Cheers. Cheers.